Good morning. Welcome to all of you to this plenary session on the overall encompassing subject of jobs and growth. I think our friends at the World Economic Forum uh, thought rightly to put this plenary session towards the end of the program, partly because the last two days had focused on many of the component issues related to the quest for jobs and growth. After all, in light of the fragile global environment, fiscal austerity, demographic shifts, revolutions, social unrest, job creation, economic growth, restoration of prosper prosperity must be on the top of every agenda for every government. And I would argue not just governments, but the business community, social actors, and the world community at large. This session is meant to be an opportunity where we bring all of the pieces together that have been looked at in the last two days. We have a fantastic group of panelists, I would argue the dream team that you, that you might want to have in any discussion of job creation and growth, representing a spectrum of policy making, civil society, the business community, old and young, within government, out of government, all with perspectives and all with contributions to this ongoing debate. Uh, I will not go through the exercise of introducing everyone, but very quickly I'll just call on the various panelists. To my left immediately is Mr. Ibrahim Dabdoub. Many of you know him as the Group Chief Executive of the National Bank of Kuwait. He is in many ways what I would refer to as the elder statesman from the Arab world who's been observing and looking at all of these issues over the past four to five decades. Immediately to his left is Mr. Joe Saadi, who is the chairman of Booz and Company, familiar to many of you from the work that his group has been engaged in, in looking at the broader ecosystem of entrepreneurship and education. To his left is Zainab Dagli, founder and chief executive of Momento. She's a global shaper from the world economic community. She is, in many ways, a uh, the member of the youth community who is going to be articulating the vision from the bottom up in how we look at these issues. To her left is Mr. Nizar Barka. His Excellency is the Minister of Economy and Finance from Morocco, the country possibly with the best prospects and the best chance of realizing the fruits of the transition and of achieving many of the demands uh, of the Arab Spring political movements, specifically job creation, prosperity, and economic growth. To his left is someone familiar to all of our friends here, not just in Turkey, but certainly within the region at large, Mr. Mustafa Koch, who is the chairman of the group. Uh, he is a larger-than-life figure who has been around, contributed both as a philanthropist, business leader, and an advisor to the policy-making community. Last but not least, uh, our dear friend John Evans from the OECD, who is a, a head of the trade union advisory, looking at broader issues of labor markets, flexibility, regulations, and how the OECD looking and tracking uh, some of the biggest economies of the world is seeing through the current dislocation and the opportunities for reform, but also for thinking anew about these issues. Uh, this is the group of panelists, I promise you, uh, and this is not just the instructions of the World Economic Forum, but also the desire of the panelists that we will have, a, hopefully, a very interactive session. Uh, after the first uh, interventions from the speakers, we will go immediately to the floor and try to create a flow of discussion and engagements around many of the issues we will touch upon. But just to get us going, I will pose uh, a question to each of the panelists, and very briefly they will respond hopefully, to this question. I will start with our dear friend, Ibrahim Debdoub. So at this moment, Ibrahim, as we're thinking about jobs and growth, uh, and fortunately, for the first time in about five years, it's not just the Arab world where we are worried about these questions. This has now become a global concern. Jobs, uh, unemployment, 
employability, uh, the dislocation that is uh, being felt across all of the labor markets in the Arab world, but also in Europe and growingly in some of the advanced countries. One immediate question that often arises in any discussion about jobs and growth is the role of the private sector versus the public sector. Now, this was the same question we posed 10 years ago, public versus private. Uh, and I guess the question to you is, are we framing the question wrong? At this moment, after 2011, specifically, especially in the Arab world, uh, are we creating an artificial dichotomy between the public sector and the private sector? So from your perspective as someone who is observing these discussions in the region and elsewhere, should the public sector and the private sector perhaps be conceiving of a different way of thinking through the problem, perhaps together, perhaps more cooperatively, and what specifically will be the position of the business community and its responsibilities to the societies? Thank you, Akhtar. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll speak about the MENA countries, of course. I will not, I'll, I'll not speak about the, Europe and Spain and Italy, but basically I'm, I'm going to speak about MENA, and I will exclude Turkey uh, out of that because uh, I do not want to challenge my friend Mustafa Koç. Uh, he, he, will, he will cover Turkey very well. As far as the Arab world is concerned, as you know, there are the rich Arabs and the poor Arabs, and, and the Arabs in the middle. When we talk about the public sector, this is not really the only problem, this is not really the only problem because the Arab world has started with the public sector. And when we talk about uh, privatizations, in other words, opening up the private sector and, 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 and uh, uh, working on the public sector, this is not really just one, uh, one solution. It's one of many solutions. Basically, we have to start uh, working on structural, structural reforms in the economies of the Arab world. Many of the Arab worlds are really, are really in, in such a bad shape that uh, uh, the, the public sector is dominant. The, the public sector is dominant. And when, when we say privatize, they don't even uh, afford to, to privatize. But let's take the rich countries versus the, the, the poor countries. I have been a proponent of what I call the Marshall Plan. And I have said that many in many, in many uh, conferences. There, are a group, there is a group of, of Arab countries who are rich. And, and when I talk about rich, I'm talking about the oil countries. They have the means and they have the reserves. I think, and, and again, that's not a very accurate number, but between Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, the UAE, actually, uh, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, the reserves that they have now are in the region of 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollars. A Marshall Plan, if it is executed well, this is the only way really to help the poor Arab countries with, con with conditionalities. In other words, I'm not going to give you money, just like Germany is doing with Greece. All you have to do is really to show me that you are, you are being very responsible and to, uh, that you will be able to, to, uh, to uh, execute the structural reforms that I will request from you. In other words, a combination of the IMF and the World Bank together. And I think this is an idea that will start a lot, of, uh, a lot of reforms in the Arab world. Beyond that, we can, we can keep talking about reforms and things like that, but these are dreams. We need the money, and nobody is going to give you the money. The IMF will not really help you a lot, and the World Bank really is not going to help you a lot. Or, or the United States. Actually, the United States need help now. They need help. So, I, I received a lot of uh, Twitters, which I'm going to read a couple of of funny ones for you, but it tells you about the young, the, how, how the young people are, are, are uh, thinking. One of them says, uh, parents struggling to keep up with the fast moving world, 18 years from now, half of the jobs will no longer exist. 
that's it, that's a young girl. Uh, underdeveloped tal talents in the MENA, current education system is outdated and does nothing to recognize and develop. And this is one of the problems that we have. Education is outdated in, in, in the Arab world. It's really outdated. It goes back to the first centuries because we still, we still uh, uh, go after quantity rather than quality. I'm, I'm very much involved in, in education. I'm on the board of the American University of Beirut and, and, and Georgetown and so on, but education is lousy in the Arab world. This is the first thing that we should work on, reform of the education. That's all I have to say, Akhtarik. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibrahim. I think the Marshall Plan idea is something we're going to take up uh, as we go f after we go through the first round. That it is a, a particular proposal that's been put on the table, uh, debated. I personally happen to have mixed feelings about it, but I'd like to learn more today. Uh, Joe, Ibrahim just evoked the issue of education, and I think you're in a position to talk about perhaps concrete measures that can be taken in the education space, in the entrepreneurship space, uh, in the micro-enterprise space, what are some of the concrete measures from your vantage points that perhaps can address problems associated with education and all the other connected uh, challenges that they give rise to in labor markets and elsewhere? The, the, first of all, on education, uh, th there is the basic stuff that needs to be done in terms of reforming, modernizing the, the education sector. Uh, uh, but this is a long-term endeavor and it will take a generation or two to action. And I think none of the countries in the region has the luxury for, uh, to wait for that to happen. So I think you're spot on to, to ask about, you know, concretely in the short term, what, uh, what can be done. And fortunately, there are a few things that are being experimented as we speak that have the potential to, to move the needle on, uh, on education and, and, and employment, for that matter. Uh, so one, one is a very close collaboration between you know, private sector or large employers, for instance, with uh, government entities and uh, you know, top universities of the region to reskill uh, some of the graduating students of the last couple of years or incoming uh, students into the labor force. Uh, by basically identifying what skills are specific, you know, technical skills are needed uh, and having programs by which uh, companies collaborate with, uh, with universities to, uh, to identify, you know, uh, the most promising students, train them with a commitment to hire them when they graduate, you know, at the top of, uh, of their class. Where government kicks in is basically they provide the funding for uh, for, uh, for, for the training and we've seen programs in Saudi Arabia where for instance for the first year or two government will also pay part of the salary of these incoming uh, students so rather pay people just to uh, stay at home and uh, you know wait until the job uh, clears there are concrete ways to channel them into the workforce in very specialized uh, areas so this, these are one, you know, some of the experiments that are that are happening and again we need to continue the, the long term process of uh, you know of modernizing the, the whole education system, but I think that will, that, that will take a bit, of, uh, a bit of time. On entrepreneurship, the region lacks the, uh, you know, any other region of the world uh, quite, uh, quite dramatically, and I think in the conference we've discussed, you know, the root causes of that. Uh, but uh, when you think about, you know, what kind of ecosystem do we need uh, uh, to encourage entrepreneurship, you know, as, as you asked the question, Tari, uh, we've done a good job so far of tackling the hardware part of the question. So if you think about, you know, we need technology parks, we need incubators. Frankly, we've seen a lot of that happened all over the Middle East over the last uh, couple of years. Where we still need to do some work to unleash entrepreneurs is on the soft areas. So for instance, uh, you know, bring entrepreneurship to the classroom. You know, something that we need to reflect on is there are roughly 400 universities in the region. Only 40 have entrepreneurship uh, courses. Only four of, out of 400 have entrepreneurship centers. And, and so we need to bring back entrepreneurship at the heart of what students, whether in high, you know, at high school or universities, are exposed to and gradually learn to, to, to feel comfortable with. That's one, one aspect uh, of it. The second major obstacle is financing. And as we know, there is almost no venture capital industry to speak of in the Middle East. There are a couple of you know, uh, VCs that have started, but nothing close to, to what is needed. So again, again there are some specific uh, uh, programs in, you know, that, that can be thought of 
uh, either funded by the state or by the private sector to, to start creating some of those VCs, uh, you know, to, al to allow access to, uh, to financing. Thirdly, there is, we've run a number of uh, public opinion surveys, there is uh, still uh, uh, discomfort with entrepreneurship in many classes of society in the Middle East. We've noticed that in various countries, uh, a government job is seen as socially more acceptable and a safer way to go uh, for, for young people as encouraged by, by their parents. And we need, as a society, to celebrate much more entrepreneurs. And just to give you, an ex uh, again, a concrete example, in Taiwan there is a program to bring back to Taiwan every year 10 or 15 successful Taiwanese entrepreneurs who've made it in the U.S. and to sh showcase them around the country, uh, to ask them to, to mentor some entrepreneurs, to share their experience, and basically celebrate the, the fact that being an entrepreneur is a good thing for, for society, and we're in bad need of, uh, of this. And finally, we need to remove the stigma from, the failure when it, from failure when it comes to entrepreneurship. In many countries of the region, you know, you go into bankruptcy, that's a one-way ticket to jail. Whereas, you know, that should be, you know, you should be able to try, fail, and not end, end up in jail. Now, some countries are trying to reform it. I think we're still quite, uh, you know, uh, quite far from where we need to be on the, on the bankruptcy front. Thank you. Continuing with the micro, I guess, Zainab, I'll come to you. How do you feel about these issues? You're a young entrepreneur in many ways. You're a social innovator. Uh, you represent the generation about whom this discussion is taking place. Yeah, exactly. I actually represent three different groups here. I represent youth, I represent women, and I represent entrepreneurs, uh, being a young female entrepreneur and a global shaper. So I hope that gives me uh, the right to be a bit daring, uh, given the lack of gray hair. Uh, but I think I would like to bring the discussion back to virtual offices and uh, that we actually had in many sessions throughout the meeting. Um, what's very important is that we are actually operating uh, in a time where things change at extreme volatility. Uh, Mr. Dabdut have also, has also mentioned that uh, he can understand now how the youth is feeling in the sense that half of the jobs are no longer going to be there uh, very soon and that nowadays we're doing different jobs. There's something called a social media expert now, which never would have been the case if Facebook never had started. Now, the type of jobs that we're doing and where jobs are going to come in the future is go really going to change dramatically. And it's very important to be uh, really in touch and at the forefront of these changes. So um, if I may just give an example about myself, I run a startup company where uh, I work with people from India, China, Turkey, whoever is giving me the best services at the time. And I then can service individuals throughout my country. Now, uh, this means that we're elevating borders, we're faster at working, and we're creating opportunities for many individuals uh, throughout the world. So I think it's, it's very important to uh, draw the attention to virtual jobs and where the future can go, especially when we're talking about the fact that uh, 75 women, 75% uh, of the women in the region are not engaged in formal economy, that we're facing such uh, serious issues in uh, youth unemployment. So we really need to think about these issues as well. And I think another thing that is, uh, another issue that is going to play a key role here is digital literacy. Because let's, let's imagine, let's imagine a newborn baby, Aisha, uh, she's born in Istanbul and she starts playing with her mother's iPad, uh, you know, in the, in the first year of her life. And then let's imagine Ahmed, uh, who's living in a more rural area of the region, who's maybe never going to have uh, access to internet uh, in his lifetime. So how do we actually close these gaps? So when I think about the future and where the future jobs are going to come from, uh, this is really going to be an important uh, factor. So promoting entrepreneurship is very important. Uh, being in touch with youth and being in touch with technology is very important. And I would make a prediction that uh, not very long from now, uh, we will actually start discussion, uh, discussing social protection of these new jobs and where that is going to go uh, in these meetings. Thank you, Zainab. I couldn't help but notice that Minister Nizar was shaking his head, nodding as you were speaking. <laughs> uh, he's had a chance to listen to three speakers already. Perhaps he can uh, frame where Morocco is heading, how he's looking at these issues of uh, job creation, entrepreneurship, and youth empowerment, having 
listen to the three speakers and their vantage points. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like, first of all, to say, as you said before, that uh, Morocco could uh, maintain a rate of growth about 5%. But the most important thing within the crisis, as you know, Morocco is very close then, uh, to Europe. We reduced unemployment, the rate of unemployment, from 10% in 2007 to 8.9% in 2011. How we did it? First of all, I think one key point is stability. Political stability, as you know, Morocco did an evolution, not a revolution. And uh, thanks to that, we have a new constitution, new government, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, we can manage and we have the uh, very important stability for our country. The second thing, and I'm talking about political stability, but I have to talk uh, about uh, the stability of our macroeconomic framework. And uh, as you know, Mar Morocco have the investment grade from Standard & Poor's and Fitch rating, and they maintain it within what it happened in all the region. Second thing, it's visibility. We work together with the private sector to define the, the sectoral strategies for the future. What are the more competitive sectors we have and how we have to do what we had to do to develop these sectors in our country. And in this, in this idea, the most important thing is div diversification. We have now new sectors. We, I will talk about three sectors, important sector. One of them is offshoring. We began with 3,000 employers, jobs created. Now we have 40,000 jobs in offshoring, and we have 40% uh, percent of the world market in French call centers. I will talk about the uh, second important thing, it's aeronautics. We, we begin with preparing the sca scaling for, for that. We, we work with skills, we have an academy in aeronautics. Now we have Bombardier who is now uh, investing in, in Morocco. That means that it's a new sector for our country. And the third, it's about uh, automotive. We have Renault who will export 400,000 vehicles a year. And thanks to that, we have the most important thing is that we, we prepare a strategy integrated strategy with an academy specific to prepare skills to work in automotive, in aeronautics, in all the new sectors I said before. Uh, the third thing, it's very important for, uh, for uh, the investors, is of course to work on climate for investments. Because we think that uh, one key point is to facilitate it, the, the investment in our country, and at the end, we, we have a strategy to develop SMEs because it's important to create uh, an SME, but the most important is to make these SMEs growing. We have 96% 90, of our uh, companies are SMEs, but 90% are small businesses. That means that we have to develop and to help them to be more competitive and to, and to grow, and of course to develop uh, what you said before, uh, culture of entrepreneurship in our country, and we have incubators specific for women to develop their enterprise. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Mr. Coach, I'm coming to you right now for what I hope is not a surprise question. Uh, we're in Istanbul. We heard Prime Minister Erdogan yesterday speak of the phenomenal economic achievement of Turkey in the last 10 years. Some of this achievement, perhaps a, a significant segment of it, required a close cooperation between the business community and the government. So I guess to relate again to the ongoing debate on whether Turkey is a model for the region, perhaps Turkey is a model for a lot of neighboring countries, including the Arab world, what is it about the role of the, pub, of the private sector? What is it about the close col collaboration between the public sector and the private sector in Turkey in the last 10 years that has made Turkey's achievement possible and can perhaps be uh, one interpretation of how Turkey can help inspire others. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm sure uh, everyone realizes that there are many lessons to be learned uh, from the case of our country. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, 2001 when we experienced the worst economic crisis of the, con of the country's history and uh, uh, when the country was led by a three-party coalition. Uh, when we hit the ground, everyone realized that uh, now it's time that something very radical had to be done. Uh, it was very difficult to realize something like that uh, in a three-party government, but uh, all segments of the society, as well as the politicians, have realized that we need a great commitment. And uh, in order to re realize that, the public sector, the private sector, the labor unions, the workers, and the government officials, they came all together and launched the most extensive austerity program. Uh, after two years, we had elections and uh, we uh, elected a single party government who came to office in 2003, uh, made the biggest, uh, wisest move uh, to adhere to fiscal discipline and to IMF program. And uh, with the uh, good collaboration uh, of the private sector together, um, the country has realized about uh, 35 to 40 billion dollars of privatization in the last uh, 10 years. The SMEs, as Mr. Minister has mentioned, is still uh, very much of the backbone of our industry. Uh, has been prospering since even though they have problems uh, working under a regulated uh, environment and uh, we suffer also a little bit uh, from unregistered economy therefore but uh, we're battling with that 70% um, of the stock exchange Istanbul stock exchange is owned by international uh, investors that were by foreign investors, which is a very uh, interesting uh, statistics. Now, when we come to some of the disadvantages what Turkey has, is that we are unfortunately energy dependent, and if we grow six, seven percent a year, uh, we always have to battle with a certain current account deficit that has to be financed properly. And for that, the entire production base has to be changed in the uh, mid to long uh, term and for that uh, you need to have educated labor force in order to produce high added value products um, and uh, in terms of education uh, I would like to touch upon that in the uh, next round what we do as a group uh, in terms of philanthropy to uh, f enhance the education further in this country, which I think is the biggest problem that we have. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, last but not least, John, have we forgotten the basics? Labor market regulations, flexibility, social protection, the debate, the future of all of this in the middle of social unrest, <coughs> revolutions, well, Tarek, perhaps I should explain in the beginning that my job is to represent unions to the OECD, not the OECD to unions, so I don't want to be accused of uh, impersonating an OECD official. Um, I agree with a lot of what the panel has been saying, but it could have been taking place in a rather benign environment without the crisis we've seen over the last three years. And I think it's worth putting some of these issues of structural changes, some of which are very positive, some of which you need to look at what is the detail, in a context of where we are now, where I think we have a jobs emergency on our hand. And I think some of the action now can't wait until we have some benign framework and policy in the medium term. I mean, your question on labor markets, just to give an example. When I go and talk to groups of, of workers in different, different parts of, of, of the world, um, there's a fundamental sense of injustice. The crisis did not start in labor markets, it started in financial markets, with failures in the banking system, with failure of regulation, failures of corporate governance. And the sense of injustice that actually it's now ordinary people, workers having to pick up the bill, being asked to, to give up things, to make sacrifices. So there's a breakdown of social trust, a breakdown of the social contract. And I think center stage is what can be done now 
to start to reconstruct that. So I'd say uh, just one or two examples. I mean, firstly, uh, we've been discussing here, I think rightly, the issue of youth. Uh, could we scale up some of the ideas which have been put on the panel? I mean, the suggestion of uh, trying to look at how you can put young people into jobs now, if necessary, with some public support. Could we get a, a region-wide and maybe a global-wide uh, youth jobs pact on the ground, where after six months young people are offered either a quality internship or an apprenticeship or a training place or a, or a subsidised employment place? Not as exploitation, not as cheap labour, where somebody has to work for six months unpaid before you can even get to look at a job, but as a real way of giving them a channel into activity and avoiding some of the hopelessness of, of youth unemployment. Um, a, a second arg argument, if we're talking of a, of a Marshall Plan, where can we get the maximum value of trying to increase infrastructure investment at the moment? Instead of talking up austerity, certainly we need medium-term, long-term fiscal discipline. Money needs to be well spent. But where can we get action now, which I think has to come uh, from governments, uh, in the areas of infrastructure investment, which can also bring about structural transformation towards a greener economy and create jobs now. Thirdly, I think we have to fundamentally look at our model um, of, of the sort of development we had for the decade before. If I start talking about labour market flexibility or structural change, in my audiences, people say, what do you mean? Are we talking about an opportunity or are we talking just about giving out protection now? So I think we have to stop looking at people trying to seek security against change and give them security in their change process. The example of how do we get a better adjusted social safety net social floor for the future, which covers a broader part of the workforce, I think is a key part of discussion which came out of G20 discussions last year, which shouldn't be forgotten. It's part of it. But also we have to look at well-functioning labour market institutions. I mean, the model we had for 20 years produced growing inequality. That is non-sustainable. We can't go on where it's the top 1% in the US which is taking 16 to 20% of wealth and the rest are really stagnating. We have to move to a fairer model of growth and that means actually putting some confidence on the ground, some concrete ideas now, not just the question of some of the structural changes to the medium term. Thank you, John. Uh, I promise to make the second round shorter in terms of the time it will consume from the discussion, but you've given us plenty of uh, of issues, you've put them on the table, and I think I'll try to kind of uh, involve others in this discussion. I'm going to go back to uh, Ibrahim Debdoub and sort of borrow the phrase action now from John and ask the question. Rather than go down the path of imagining a Marshall Plan that's going to be led by, I don't know which countries, that's going to require establishing some sort of a structure, modality, procedures, conditionality, uh, and might require a long period of time to institutionalize and implement such a plan. Why don't the business groups, the corporate sector in the region, uh, take action now in the areas where they exert immediate influence, where they can make commitments and help have results on the ground? Why shift the discussion and the responsibility to governments and to the international community? Tarek, you were a professor before uh, Josmoud for being a researcher. I used to be. Ehna in the business we are not charities. I, I am in the I am in the in the in the in the banking business for 51 years. Unless you can prove to me that you are worthy of borrowing, I will not lend you. So we are not charities. This is not the responsibility of the businesses. We can talk about it's nice. Social, social responsibility is nice. But this is the responsibility of the governments. Let the governments first make structural changes to, to, to uh, uh, create the right, the right uh, atmosphere and the right envi environment for business to create jobs. At the end, it's nice to talk about business. I can write you books about our social corporate responsibilities and our and, and how much we help uh, uh, hospitals and things like that. But it is not, this is not the real world. The real world is going down to the streets and see how to create jobs. Really, this is the real world. And the only way to do it is for the governments to make structural, structural changes. For example, privatization. We are assuming that public, public uh, companies are not well managed, they are not efficient, and, and that 
if we privatize them, we will have better management, and as such, we create jobs. That's probably the way to do it. And that's the, end, that's the, the ultimate goal, really, of privatizing, is to create jobs and to, to get rid of inefficient companies by the government because it's not well run. And this is how I look at it. As I said, I'm, I am a man of the street. I am, I'm deep in, in the business. I cannot say more than that. I'm sorry. Thank you, Thank you Ibrahim. Uh, I'm just trying to sort of un unpack the issues a bit. Uh, and I think Joe had given a hint earlier about maybe a newer way of thinking about this, rather than thinking of public and private and the responsibilities of each. He said closer collaboration between some uh, components of the public sector and maybe some of the large employers. Maybe that is the right entry point. Can you expand on this a bit more, Joe? What yeah. do you mean? And how does this create action? Yeah. First of all, I would agree that it is the solution does not lie in the in the private sector alone. I mean, uh, they have their their own imperatives and, and constraints, and it, it is really the, the collaborative effort of the three worlds, you know, of academia, government, and private sector that that will will prove fruitful. But what some of the large, you know, in the research that we've done and the work that we're doing with some of our clients, what some large employers can do is uh, basically create the space for a uh, entrepreneurs or small medium businesses to, to flourish. So for instance, for historical reasons in the GCC, some of the large state-owned companies have been and have gone into the housing business, the medical business, the transportation business, because at the time they were created, there was none of this uh, and, and they had to, to do it themselves. Well, today there is some thinking going on that, hey, we don't need to be in, in this. Let's, let us leave you know, uh, our own employees to basically, for instance, spin off these activities and, and start serving the market and, and, grow, and, and grow these. And uh, some of the work that we've done shows that this will create you know, service industry jobs, which is the way to, uh, to go. On another front, you know, on the education side, there are, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, experiments going on uh, in terms of training. Uh, you know, we've, we've highlighted in our report the case of SABIC or, or, or Saudi Aramco, for instance, uh, who are uh, collaborating with universities with funding from the state to train hundreds of, uh, of, of graduating uh, students with a view to providing the best of them with a job once they, they come out of, uh, of, of, of this. Thank you, Joe. Just staying with the, with the theme of action and what can be done practically, um, Mr. Nizar, are you waiting for a Marshall Plan or are you hoping for a slightly uh, more modest set of uh, goals or, and roles from the private sectors, both in the region and outside? Well, uh, I think that uh, the private sector can play a very important uh, role now. And uh, for that, uh, we have to say that uh, there is two things. I would like, first of all, to, to say that I agree with Mr. Evans when he said that it's very important to change our economic model. Why? Because it's very important to have a new distribution of, of jobs in the world. And I think that... Uh, now, it's, uh, with, with the crisis, we, we all know, it's a good mo momentum to do it. I will, I will say here that it's very important for us and for all to have uh, um, a development of industries in our countries. And it's very important to have a co-localization. That means that some industries can begin to work with uh, Morocco and with Turkey to, to have better competitivity and to create jobs. The second very important thing, of course, we, as you said about the private sector, I think it's, uh, it's very important to, to distinguish three things. First, what I said before, small and medium businesses. <coughs> the government has to help to assist them to, to grow, and uh, that's why we developed uh, uh, Guarantee Fund to, to, to let them uh, have to, the access to finance because it's a big challenge for them. It's very important we have on stock exchange a component specific for small and medium businesses. We, we developed uh, at the same time, uh, we, we reduce the, the, the tax companies from 30% to 15% for small and medium businesses. 
That's what the government can do. And of course, we give technical assistance from the beginning to for the two uh, first years uh, to get, get, let them uh, uh, be uh, maintain their their uh, the jobs and maintain, of course, uh, the, their uh, their work. Uh, the, the, I have to talk about big companies. Big companies can play, I'm, I'm talking about foreign direct investments, and big companies can play very important things. First of all, develop process. In our countries, it's very important to have these kinds of process to be more productive, to have more productivity, and at the same time to create new, new kinds of jobs. Second thing, I think that we, the, as you said, Mr. Said, we are talking about uh, social responsibility, but it's better to talk about development responsibility because big companies can play a very good, uh, important thing on, on the de uh, how to develop the country. And, uh, and there is responsibility now within the crisis to create new kinds of jobs. And the third thing, and I, I think it's, uh, it's very important too, is to, uh, to have a um, roadmap to know exactly what kinds of skills we need for the future and to prepare these kinds of skills and to give the orientation. And it's very important for our country, as you know, for our countries, you have to, to change mentality, we have to change the culture to develop entrepreneurship, uh, uh, these kinds of uh, culture of entrepreneurship. That's why it's very important to, uh, to develop models. As Mr. Z Mrs. Zainab, it's very important to see her talking about how she did, and then people would like to do the same. Zainab, on the same models, the role of technology, how much is technology going to play in terms of a role and perhaps dealing with some of these issues that the minister has just outlined? What do you see? What are some things that perhaps we're missing out on that can help us? I mean, I think um, governments and corporations uh, play a big role in uh, job creation, and there's a lot that uh, companies can do in the sense that um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of companies are happy of my uh, startup's existence. So uh, fostering that is actually also uh, giving them a financial benefit as well. So if they don't have time to discuss anything outside of financials, we are giving them financial benefits. So uh, it can be interesting for corporations to uh, support entrepreneurship as well. Um, and uh, models are, I think, also very, very important. Uh, okay, let's, let's go back in how uh, governments and corporates go hand in hand. Uh, if I wasn't experiencing political stability in Turkey, uh, political and economic stability in Turkey, maybe I never would have uh, left my studies in, uh, in the UK to come back and start up my own company. Uh, so I need that uh, groundwork uh, to have been done already. Uh, so that's, that's a very critical uh, role that governments play there. But the more case studies there are, the more models there are about successful entrepreneurship, uh, people are more daring to actually try themselves. Because uh, if we're constantly talking about entrepreneurship and how we should do it and the culture of entrepreneurship, that it shouldn't be shameful to fail and that you can start again, uh, then you should see uh, models where people have been successful and models where people have, been, have failed and started again and have been successful. So it's ex extremely important to have models and uh, case studies. Thank you. Mustafa, I think this is a, the right opportunity to, to invite you to discuss the role of philanthropists, uh, corporate I'm leaders as philanthropists and the specific role that you're playing in education. Yes, I'm going to uh, give an example uh, in, for, from the industry. Uh, we have the biggest problem that we face in terms of unemployment in the industry is the mismatch between supply and demand. That is, saying, by saying that uh, we mean there is 10, 9 to 10 percent unemployment in this country, but uh, you have uh, vast difficulties finding skilled workforce for factories and for production. So. In realizing that, we also studied some statistics, and uh, the statistics show that a vocational uh, educated student has always a better chance to find a job than an average college, 
graduate. When we saw that, we have decided to work with the Minister of Education and launch a vocational school program uh, about five years ago, 2007, with a $50 million budget. 8,000 students were addressed, and uh, there were 264 vocational schools involved with this. We have built 28 laboratories in 28 schools to enhance skills of the students, and 350 people were engaged uh, from our own uh, group, from different, uh, as much as 20 companies, as coaches to coach and mentor these uh, students. Now, uh, here the biggest uh, uh, aim that uh, we envis in envisage was gender equality. Because in Turkey right now, high school education rate uh, is 51% uh, boys to 39% girls, compared to uh, Europe's rates, 75% boys and 81% girls. So 50-50 gender equality, boys and girls, are of utmost, were utmost of importance uh, to us. And this program uh, addresses issues as, as, as important as skills development, social development, employ employability, and uh, gender uh, e equality. And I'm very proud to say that this year, uh, this program was chosen as the region's best program uh, as youth employment by international labor organization. So this is maybe a drop in the ocean but I hope it will be a pioneer and a role model for other companies to address this problem as well. Thank you, Mustafa. John, finally. I thought you were going to ask me a question, so. Um, <laughs> just a, just a, a, a comment, uh, uh, Tarek. I mean, the, the private sector globally in the G20 countries at the moment is sitting on a lot of money. I mean, the profits are at their record level. The, the Fortune 500 companies are making record returns. And everybody is frightened about the future. That there's no demand, there's no growth, employment doesn't seem to be coming. So the issue of confidence, I think, is key. And I, I mean, I, I worry, certainly, the financial sector and bankers have to be responsible about money. But financial markets are also sheep, you know. I mean, when, when things were going wonderfully in the US in the, in, the, in the speculative period, you know, they were lending money out as if there was no tomorrow. Now nobody wants to lend money. Everybody has to restore their balance sheets. So how to break into that circle to get the money going into different areas? And I think that's, that, that, that is, a, that is a, key, a key factor. Certainly, what's been put on the table on the question of skills is a crucial issue. The situation does vary between different countries. At the moment, in the European community, there are 20, nearly 25 million people unemployed. There are about 4 million un uninfilled vacancies. Obviously, there's measurement problems, but nevertheless, you've got six people looking for every job. So you have to get investment in skills and upgrade, but at the same time, you have to have jobs. It's no good just having better trained and more educated people in a more of a rat race actually looking for jobs. So you have to intervene on both areas. Now, in the B20 and the L20, uh, in, a, in 10 days' time in Los Cabos, I think you'll see that business and labor are going to be presenting ideas like how do we scale up quality apprenticeships? How do we get a better approach to some of these ideas on a youth pact and the question of quality internships? There are certain things which need to be done, but there has to be a breakthrough on that question of confidence. And I think what, what's been put on the table, I wouldn't necessarily call it... Um, um, Philanthropy, I would call it enlightened self-interest of the private sector wanting to ensure educational institutions. But I know nothing, and excuse my, my ignorance here in, in, in Turkey, but leaving you know, these gleaming spires of the hotels where we're having these meetings or staying, if you walk up the hill to the in, in, in Istanbul Technical University, you've got a crumbling edifice. Now, how do you change that allocation of resources where the real investment is in educational systems, not in luxury hotels? or maybe both, but I think the symbolism here is quite significant about what could be done if you can try and harness public and private resources together. Thank you, John. We've got uh, bad news and good news for you. Uh, the bad news is we have another 45 minutes to go before we close this session. The good news is it's really going to be all about an interactive 
uh, discussion between you and the panelists. So the floor is open for people to make comments, uh, or raise questions, and perhaps we'll try to take two to three questions at a time. And we'll start with the gentleman to my left. Please identify yourself. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, my name is Mohammed Lassas uh, from the American University in Beirut. The issues we agree on, the issues you've identified, the, the financial inclusion, the uh, economic restructuring, labor market regulation, everything we've said are perhaps the same issues we could have identified 10 years ago. And as we've just heard, the private sector doesn't, um, doesn't think, and perhaps rightly so, it's their job to lead this transformation. The government bureaucracy is not interested, uh, incapable, unwilling, and strongly, I don't think it can uh, lead this reform. How do you break this deadlock so that 10 years from now we're not identifying the same exact issues again? Thank you, Mohammed. Cornelia Meyer. Um, I have um, sort of two question comments, very short. One is where the private sector and um, business can really, and, and government can work you know, very well together is, if you want to create the entrepreneurs, it's not just about access to capital, it's also about, it's also about the framework, obviously, the bankruptcy laws and so on. It's also about access to skills. And if one could set up skills center where big companies team up with the government so a young budding entrepreneur can go and have his legal issues addressed and his accounting issues addressed. They exist, but there needs many, many more of them. Then the other one is vocational training, and Turkey has done a great job, and um, certainly Koch Industries has done a great job about really going about it in terms of looking at it as a framework, because it's not just, oh, we need vocational training. There needs to be a whole structure around how do you create apprenticeships, and, and how do you make them work. But there's another issue, and that is an attitudinal issue. Um, less so in Turkey, but in lots of the MENA region, there is no, no status to working with your hands. Try and find a wife if you're a plumber in Cairo. Nobody will marry their daughter off to you. So there is again where government can come in and where media can come in and where role models can come in, you know, having, giving, making it hip, making it in to be working with your hands, to being a plumber, being a carpenter and having that vocational training so you can slowly, this, it, it, this is a journey of many, many steps. You can slowly tr uh, change the attitudes. Thank you. We'll take one question from this side of the room. Uh, thank you, Tariq. Selim Eddi, I work for SAP, a software company. And uh, I would like just to, uh, on the issue of the role of technology, uh, if I suggest that it's not only about technology here, if you look at what has happened in the Arab Spring, it is this uh, blurring of the social media with the mainstream media that created a new force to be reckoned with. And that is probably the fourth power, it used to be called the fourth power, this is the, the new media uh, has made the impossible possible. So the question is, we are faced with an impossible task here, which is growth and jobs. How can this very same uh, uh, power of the social media as backed by technology and connecting various stakeholders, how can all this be leveraged to, make the, to solve this, this uh, monumental challenge we're facing? And uh, there is a multiplier effect here between the social media uh, and the mainstream media. That's, that's one multiplier effect. But the bigger multiplier effect is if, if the citizen and the youth are connected to the back offices of the government that have a huge amount of data and to the back offices of the banks and the enterprises that actually will create the new jobs. Uh, so the value proposition here is, is to have all these stakeholders meet on a new platform, meet to collaborate, innovate, and create. Thank you, Salim. Maybe we'll just get some responses to this and we'll do a second round. Uh, can I ask you the question, Ibrahim? Uh, the first question, how to break the gridlock? Assuming there is gridlock, how do we break through this gridlock? Um. I would like to, to, uh, to repeat what I have said before, basically, that the, the private sector 
is involved, but the private sector is, is bottom line uh, oriented, and it's really up to the government now to make it to make it uh, in such a way through through reforms and structural reforms that will meet the private sector sector's uh, uh, requirements, so that private sector, through, through privatization, for example, and things like that, so that the private sector can create jobs. But the private sector alone, out of, uh, we have social corporate responsibility, and we, we, some, we donate, but this is not going to, to create jobs. To create jobs is basically when the government or the leadership takes charge, takes charge and, and does structural reforms, economic, macroeconomic structural reforms, so that we have new businesses. For example, when I was talking about the, the Marshall Plan, the Marshall Plan, most of the Arab countries have deficits, continuing deficits, year after year after year. They, they, for, take Egypt, for example. Egypt, why should the IMF help Egypt? Why can't the Arab world help Egypt? Take, for example, now the reserves of the Central Bank of Egypt. And I was involved with that, with the governor. The reserves of the Central Bank of Egypt were going down day by day. Saudi Arabia came in and, and deposited uh, deposits in the central bank. This is the kind of Arab relations that I would like to see. Because suppose that Egypt goes into political and social upheaval. The whole Arab world is going to be affected. And this is where I think we are so definitely interrelated. It's definitely interrelated. And we can help each other in, 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 uh, in restructuring the, the economies. That's, that's the idea of the Marshall Plan. Uh, Mustafa, do you want to react to the gridlock issue? Well, I completely agree what uh, Ibrahim Bey has uh, already said. Uh, but um, uh, here, the structural reforms are very, very important. And one other important thing is, of course, within the structural reforms, that uh, the government provides a necessary uh, investment climate where you can attract more foreign direct investment, which are uh, built uh, as greenfield projects, which will enhance uh, unemployment, create more jobs, and also uh, also enhances uh, growth. Uh, what? How can you do that? You can uh, uh, give tax breaks. You can widen the, widen the tax structure, tax base, and shifting uh, to a more growth-friendly uh, tax structure uh, would be a very good uh, way to start this. To uh, uh, lure more foreign direct investment in Turkey and lessen the bureaucracy, of course, is also very, very important. Thank you. Zainab, on what Salim mentioned, the role of the interaction between social media and technology in uh, helping the ecosystem, do you want to react to that? Um, well, social media is becoming uh, extremely important. Uh, if we look at it today, there are even individuals with two million followers uh, they can write their own media, they can write their own press, and uh, this is creating uh, an incredibly different balance now. So um, I think it's going to be even more important uh, in the future to follow uh, the changes and uh, what's happening in the world. So uh, social media is important, technology is important uh, in the way we act. And... Um, almost following up a bit on your question as well, the, uh, what the entrepreneurs want, what we're trying to do with social media, everybody's trying to understand uh, what, the, what the issues are and how we can really use that. Uh, so everything that is not understood completely yet provides an opportunity. So uh, how can we think better to actually uh, make something out of this? We'll go with, for another round of questions. We'll start in the back. Um, good morning. My name is Hussam Mahmoud. I'm the CEO of Al Dahwa Agricultural Company. Uh, we work on the security food program of GCC countries and mainly on UAE. Uh, I uh, listened to what uh, Mr. Ibrahim Dabdoub said about the Marshall Plan, about the rich and the poor and the medium Arab countries. I think an agriculture project for the security food program of GCC can be a very good Marshall Plan to start to create the jobs, to create these dynamics that we're talking about, building this new economy. 
we already succeeded in creating jobs and uh, uh, grow crops in the desert of Egypt, then I think we can do this anywhere else in the world. And this can create lots of jobs in agriculture, in finance, in logistics, in ports, in customs, everything. Then we need the, the agriculture ministers, we need the regulators, we need the, the GCC countries to sit all around one table and work together on this plan, and I think it can be a good success story. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen in the front. My name is Guru Lalwani. I want to ask the panel if there was a partnership between the governments in different countries and the private sector where the government gave tax incentives to people for whatever percentage of employees they take on during the year, they get reduction in their corporation tax. I think this will give every business an incentive to take more people on because normally in England you have to declare every year how many employees you've got. So if you've got a thousand employees year end and you've got 1,200 the following year you increase your employees by 20 percent so you get some sort of a tax incentive on your corporation tax. I think that's one way it will give incentives to companies to increase rather than reduce their workforce. Thank you. I'd like to have a comment from yes. the panel. Lutz Bauer, Zurich Sigorta, Turkey. Being privileged, uh, educated in Europe, in the European part of Eurasia, and having cheap access to education, I'm a bit shocked about the cost of education, for example, here in Turkey. It is, and I believe it's similar, probably in the Mideast as well, if really people want to get good education, and I take one of our middle class, upper middle class employees, both working one, em one income only for education. And as I heard a lot about importance of education and how can it provide it reasonably, on a reasonable cost, to a wider part of population. Thank you. Uh, Minister Nizar, tax incentives. Uh, I, I heard it's very interesting what, uh, what you said about uh, how we can uh, help and uh, give incentives for uh, companies to, to create jobs. Uh, it can be interesting to, to learn and to, to study how we can do it, as you, as you said. But I think that uh, what, what, we, what we did in Morocco, it's uh, giving for companies, for example, for the period of training, the government pay the training and give wage for the person, for the young people who is training during one year. And after, if the, the company decide to create the jobs for him or for her, the government pay one year of social uh, charges, social costs. It's what we did about it. Yeah, we have it in Morocco now. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, yesterday, sir, we did not agree on Hong Kong and Singapore. Today, I agree 120 percent with you. The more, the more you create tax incentives, the more companies will be able to create more jobs. I totally agree with you. As far as the manual labor is concerned, the lady there, I, I agree, but the, the economies in the world are, are changing structurally. These are service economies. And the best example, for example, is the, is the U.S. It's not creating new jobs. The, now, it's not, it's not the old industrial age anymore. That's the problem. It's, these are structural changes that will, that, will, that will serve against creating jobs. Joe, on the education bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as the Middle East is concerned, and particularly to the GCC, the issue, the issue there is not so much the cost of education as it is the quality of education. If you look at uh, long-term trends in terms of enrollment into you know, various cycles of schooling or universities, or in terms of spending on infrastructure, uh, the region is where it needs to be. However, the, the issue is that uh, there is no emphasis on the quality of the teaching. There is not enough emphasis on identifying, like, uh, 
uh, was done in Morocco, the kind of specific skills we're training uh, uh, people to, to graduate uh, uh, with, and, and therefore people come out and, uh, you know, you can't match uh, the job market uh, requirements with, with, with the skills. I mean, again, take the GCC where you have a large, disproportionately large expatriate population, and yet you have uh, substantial unemployment among, among the youth. And this is solely due to the fact that we're not uh, uh, equipping them with, with the skills that are, that are needed. So I would say the issue is much more with the quality and the type of education as a, rather than, than the cost of, uh, of education. John. I, I think there's, there's one um, comment I'd make which I think is a response to a number of the questions, which is how do you move to a system of more inclusive growth? And I mean, obviously education is a key, and you've seen countries which have a, a virtuous circle of being able to get wide access. It, it is both quantity and quality. It, it's it's the, the high cost of, of getting access to quality education, which is the problem, not any form of education. So prioritizing that, I think, has to be one key part of, part of government policy, but then should be in the interest of the private sector as well for areas of trying to get effective partnerships which, which work. And on the question of, I mean, the, the point question was raised earlier about, about skills and manual work and so on. I, I think the simple answer is you also need to raise wages at the bottom. You need to get the rewards for actually the jobs which, which are needed at the moment. And at the same time, work out some new social contract of how people use skills inside companies. People don't leave their brains behind when they walk into a, into a factory or, a, or an office. And that is an untapped skill. If we're going to invest in skills, you need to unlock that potential in the future, which is crucially, which is crucially important. Um, one last comment, I mean, on the, on the remark that nothing has changed. I mean, I'm not, I'm not from the, the MENA region, but if I looked at one part of the world which seems to have changed enormously in the last 10 years, it is the MENA region. I mean, not that people have suddenly set out, we want structural reform. But they said, we, we, we don't want kleptocracy. We don't want uh, the heads of our, our ruling families on the boards of all the companies which move in here. We don't want uh, bribery and corruption. We don't want non-functioning public institutions. Now, how do you tap that public demand for a reform of public institutions and then a partnership with the private sector which actually creates trust again? And I think that big picture issue is behind all of the things we've been discussing on the panel. Thank you, John. Our last final round of questions. We have not taken a question from this side of the room. Before I call on, on somebody whose name I know. Okay, we'll come back. Go ahead. Great panel, thanks a lot. My name is Sarah Akcholo. I'm the CEO of Citibank in Turkey. An idea which I'd like to get your views on is trying to tackle three things at the same time, you know, which is an issue for the world, education, specialized training at all levels, not just university, and churning talent. What about the idea of having industry leaders by industry have formulate um, technical schools, not university level, but at maybe primary, secondary, and uh, you know, high school level, and having an automotive specialized, having you know, construction specialized high schools, having you know, specialized so that's one idea which I'd love to get your views on. Second, the government putting an incentive program around this to promote the industries which actually are the ones the country wants to invest in. Thank you. So another hand here, right behind. Thank you. Uh, Peter Atal Montalto, an emerging market economist at Nomura. Um, throughout the meetings yesterday and today, uh, I think there's been too much optimism on the Eurozone crisis. So it's interesting and right that uh, John Evans has highlighted that there is a jobs crisis going on, um, and we need to be aware of that. So in a sense, I want to flip the question um, in the title of the panel on its head. How do we prevent um, job losses in this environment in particular? And is one of the ways, uh, particularly in Europe, a question for, for John, to perhaps lower um, minimum wages in, in real terms um, to enable companies to keep on uh, more, uh, more labor. Thank you. Joe, technical schools? Uh, I would, 
on your question, I would completely agree that this is, you know, a very important way, a way to go. Uh, uh, ju just if I look back at, uh, again, at, at the Middle East, a lot of spending is going to be going into healthcare for, for healthcare, for instance. So we should definitely be training, you know, for more nurses and more doctors in various parts of, of the world. Take retail, for instance, which has a great opportunity to absorb, you know, some of the nationals in, in, the, in the Gulf state. Again, retail institutes, I was discussing yesterday with someone attending the conference, I don't know if he's here. I mean, they are thinking now, they, they are an industry leader in retail in the Middle East. They are thinking of creating a retail uh, institute. There are examples of, you know, Mitsubishi with their local partner in Saudi creating a lifts, uh, uh, a lifts mechanics uh, institute, a car, a car mechanics institute. So that is definitely one way to, uh, to go. Yes, me. Yes, it's a, yeah, I'm agree with you. It's exactly what, what we're doing in Morocco. Mm -hmm. we, we did it for automotive. And uh, the most important thing is, first of all, we take the best standards, international standards. And second thing, we pay for the training. The government pay for the training. We did it for automotive, we did it for aeronautics, we did it for textile, we did it for uh, construction, uh, we did it uh, for uh, information and uh, technology for, for information. And that's specialization. Of course, it's not open for all, but the most important thing is to have uh, the, the, all the supply we need, their industry needs for the, for the future and to invest in our country. Um, on the, um, what can be done to try to save jobs, particularly in the Eurozone at the moment, I, mean, I think looking back to the period 2008-2009, what was quite interesting was that different economies performed very differently in terms of what happened to unemployment, not just in Europe, but more broadly. And it wasn't necessarily the case with the, the economies which were so-called flexible labor markets, which did better. I mean, the US just saw its unemployment surge, whereas in Germany we now have unemployment which is the lowest for 20 years. And I think, I mean, two things uh, I would argue were quite significant in achieving that result. One was uh, uh, across the board an agreement both between companies and unions on the importance of maintaining skilled labor and then a government ability to back up and support that through schemes like short-time working uh, subsidies so that when companies were faced by downturns in demand, they just didn't fire their skilled workforces. They kept them there, they moved to short-time working. The gap in demand was made up by the government and where possible, there were also additional possibilities to retrain and reskill workers. So I think there's lessons to be learned there, how you might look at that as being applicable, obviously in countries which are in different, different situations. I think the the risk of cutting wages in a recession, as we see now, is, is that is part of the problem, not part of the solution. I mean, obviously, the question of the relationship between minimum wages and average wages is an issue which has to be looked at in a different context. But we now see, if you look at the Euro European Commission spring report, the bit of good news they, they express is that the fact there's been a fall in, in real wages in the Eurozone. I mean, I see that as a disaster. You know, we're seeing a collapse of demand. We're seeing actually, I don't think poverty, growing poverty, is going to get the confidence back for growing demand. So I think in the current circumstances, there may be other points in a business cycle where it's different. We need to be trying to support demand, support wages, and put flaws into the systems. In the longer term, it's crucially important. I think it's been interesting. There's been a talk about how you establish social safety nets and social flaws, how you finance that. What is the role of co-funded systems? There's a lot of work going on in the ILO on this at the moment. I think clearly there has to be some imaginative thinking on that. A last point I'd make on the point about, about skilled labor. My own personal view is that the, the dual systems which have actually relied upon industry, often, as in Germany, working with a strong union input on, on apprenticeships, and also then scaling that up to a, to a nationwide system, have worked rather well and have stood, a, have, have stood the, 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 you know, the test of time. It's not always easy to take that model and transport it into another country, but certainly on the labor side, and this is what we hope may happen coming out of this G20 meeting, which may be a bit more lasting than a final communique by the, by the heads of state in Los Cabos, is some sort of template for at least the G20 countries between business and labor, L20 and B20, of looking at exactly what is that sort of training system on apprenticeships. So I'd like to hope that maybe if we're having this conversation a year from now, we could come back and say, look, something has happened there which has moved 
a bit the barometer in the right direction and we just didn't wait for somebody else to do it. Thank you, John. We're going to take the final sets of interventions from the speakers. Uh, wrap it up for us, Ibrahim. What have you heard today that excited you? What possibly has uh, well, reinforced uh, everything, your... Well, everything is exciting. Uh, but basically, uh, creating jobs in the, in the MENA, in, in, in the Arab world, at the end depends a lot on the kind of the efficiency of the governments in, in those particular countries. Uh, again, I, I, I hate to repeat it, but basically what we need is uh, basic structural reforms, which the, most of the Arab countries are not doing in terms of privatization, in terms of education, in terms of creating the right environment for the private sector really to create jobs. That is one, one point. The other point, as far as I'm concerned, I know you don't like it, but basically uh, the, the, the Arab Marshall Plan is, is a dream of mine, and I am going to work on it until I die. Basically, the, the Arab world, especially the poor Arab countries, need a lot of help, and there is no need for the IMF or the World Bank to get involved. We can do the work of the IMF and the World Bank together in a way that will be able to create growth in some of the poor Arab countries. These are the two points. Thank you, Ibrahim. Joe, yeah. the ecosystem of entrepreneurship and education synthesize the issues. Yeah. Maybe trying to get it you know, all, all together under, under one, one roof, uh, so to speak. Uh, we've talked a lot about education and the main challenge there is how to better match the job market requirements with the skills that are being provided and there are different ways of doing it. We've talked a lot about you know, entrepreneurship and how you can create the right ecosystem so that startups and SMEs flourish and SMEs are badly underrepresented in the economic fabric of, uh, of, of the Middle East, uh, un unlike, uh, unlike Turkey. Uh, we've talked a lot about economic diversification. The minister from Morocco mentioned those new sectors, I mean, aeronautics in, in Morocco, but, but closer to, again, closer to home, I mean, all the service-related sector of healthcare, retail, hospitality provide ample room for, for, uh, for job uh, creations, creation. And, and, and fourth, uh, another way to think about the Marshall Plan is to think, and that's another dream of mine, which is to think more about moving the needle on economic integration. Step back for a moment and think about the Middle East. Here's a region where people for centuries and until World War I have been roaming around with no boundaries or no frontiers, speak the same language, generally share the, the, uh, the same culture, and yet are at the lowest point of economic integration of any other region in the world when you think about NAFTA, when you think about Mercosur, when we think even about the early stages of European Union. So another way to think about the Marshall Plan is to think about, just you know, start with the way uh, the six or nine members of the EU were in the 50s and 60s and, and, and 70s and at least get that minimum integ economic integration uh, going. Someone asked very rightfully so the question on gridlock. Why would it be different now than it was 10 years ago? And it is true, we've been discussing this for the last 10 or 15 years. I think the reason for hope is that all governments in the region frankly have been put on notice with the Arab Spring and there is no choice but to get going on, 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 on some of this. It is just a matter of getting everyone organized and everyone working together. Thank you, Joe. Zainab. I think uh, what I take away from these discussions is that youth, women, entrepreneurship is important and you can put an and slash or uh, in between any of these three words. Uh, and I think it's important for both governments and corporations if I tell you what we do as entrepreneurs, as a species of humankind, when we get together, uh, we sit and we constantly think, okay, what can we do? What if there was a social app that did this? And if we set an e-commerce site that did that? So we're uh, constantly thinking about how we actually merge technology, social media together and uh, actually uh, bring economy forward with that. If I meet global shapers from around the world, I can very easily talk to my friend from the Ramallah Hub and say, okay, how can we make our both e-commerce sites work together? And I no longer need to be a huge corporation to be able to elevate borders and do that. So I think it's important for both governments and corporates uh, to foster entrepreneurship, uh, to foster uh, youth uh, women uh, entrepreneurship, and there's a role for everyone here. Thank you, Zainab. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say that, uh, uh, first of all, it's very important to have a partnership with public and private uh, sector. 
uh, we did it for strategy and we have now a council to, for uh, uh, climate for investments presided by the chief of the government. It's a private and public council. And thanks to that, we know exactly what we have to do every year to have a better environment for investments. The second thing, I agree with what you said before, integration, economic integration into the MENA region and into the Arab world. I think it's very important now. With the crisis with Europe, it's the key time to do it. And uh, I, I, I have to say that only for the, for the Maghreb region, we think that we can win two points of GDP if there, are, there is an integration in the Maghreb. That means that we can create one million jobs in five years, new jobs in our countries with opening of the border and doing economic integration. And Morocco work for it. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> in order to have a long and sustainable social peace, we have to tackle uh, unemployment and especially youth unemployment, not only in, uh, in Turkey, in any uh, country. And for that, private sector and government, they have to work hand in hand uh, together and the uh, government has to introduce uh, necessary incentives to um, improve uh, the investment environment for uh, investors, domestic and foreign investors to come to a country in order to create jobs and uh, enhance further growth, I think. I think the, the old view of just looking at headline growth figures has gone. You have to look at what sort of models of equitable growth, well-distributed gains of growth are now going to be sustainable in the future and look behind those growth figures to look at all of those other indicators. Um, so the model of equitable growth in the future, I think, has to stay here, and that's part of the lesson that has to be translated also into the creation of, of decent employment, and particularly for young people and women as a key at the start. I think there are models and successes, not just as we've been discussing here in Turkey, but other countries, even outside the industrialized countries, perhaps more outside the industrialized countries, have had some success. I just mentioned one in the case of Brazil, which has reduced the Gini coefficient by six and a half points in 10 years, at the same time of maintaining pretty fast growth. So some of the solutions are out there. Uh, it's a question of the political will to apply them. Thank you, John. I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, invite Nick Davis from the World Economic Forum to share with us very briefly in the last few minutes we have uh, a description and the progress on an important initiative that the World Economic Forum has been making in the space of uh, thinking through job creation, thinking through employment, and thinking through growth. Uh, the World Economic Forum, as most of you know, has uh, made a very sustained commitment to uh, developing thought leadership, to uh, convening and expanding uh, the policy discussion and the programmatic discussion in the space. So, Nick Davis, I'd like to invite you to come and share with us very briefly before we close. Thank you, Tarek, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we all agree, both on this panel in the room, that we are facing, as John said, uh, a jobs emergency. Uh, youth unemployment in the MENA region uh, was estimated by the ILO at over 26% in 2011. Uh, that's uh, twice the rate of the global youth unemployment average. It's four times the rate of the unemployment rate for adults in the region and it's the highest uh, youth unemployment rate of any region. And this is something really that the forum and this panel and everyone here is, uh, is thinking very seriously about. Part of the work that the World Economic Forum is doing in this area is, as John said, to work with the B20 uh, uh, by giving input into the G20 Leaders Forum, which is happening in uh, two weeks' time in Los Cabos. And uh, we have, uh, through under the, under the leadership of Jeffrey Jerez from Manpower Group, Chris Gopalakrishnan from Infosys, uh, and other members of the task force, such as John Evans, uh, Mukhtar Kent from, from Coke, uh, we have developed uh, five sets of recommendations which are incredibly aligned with the conversation we've had to, here today. And those are to spur strategic infrastructure investments that can create jobs, particularly linked to the green economy, 
to work on labour market reforms and adjustments uh, that maintain social protection and increase the opportunity for activity uh, for a wide range of society, including people who are currently marginalised from the, the workforce. Uh, there's been a big push in the group to focus on how to support small and medium-sized enterprises and innovative business models in recognising them as the drivers of employment creation. And then finally, a big piece on skills, which has been a theme of, of today, which is to look at how we can not only create closer connections between the private sector uh, and academic institutions, education departments, uh, but also to create connections uh, uh, between the society and the apprenticeships, internships and employability skills uh, that are required. And then just a final note from, from us that in a jobs emergency, as I think has come very clear from the discussion today, you do need two things. You need this cyclical intervention, an urgency, a pickup by the relevant actors uh, to take action now, uh, to make sure that commitments are scalable, uh, to make sure that commitments are locally adapted and that they are uh, uh, also accountable and measurable over time. But you also need at the same time these structural changes that fix skills mismatches. And so if anyone has any further ideas, case studies or a willingness to get involved with the work that the forum's doing on, on this, um, please do get in touch with me or anyone else uh, in the forum because this is something that we're taking seriously and I really appreciate the the firepower and, and insight and thinking of our great panelists today and Tarek for, for moderating it so beautifully. Uh, so thank you very much and back to you to close. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for being with us today in this uh, second and last day of uh, this important meeting and uh, maybe the last few hours of it. Just I'd like to invite everyone to uh, join me in thanking the, the panelists for their engagement with us.